Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Brutes, where we tell the stories behind your favorite beer. This is Sound Guy Ryan, and joining me, as always, is Matt. That's right. Erica had to work this week, which is such a bummer. I know, and I'm back. And I always say, as always, but clearly these last few weeks, it hasn't been as always. Yeah, we had Sound Guy Jazz, which, in my opinion, was a very good version of Sound Guy Ryan. I hear he's a nicer version of Sound Guy Ryan. You know, he's more optimistic. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we had an awesome episode last week. Uh, we had Brewery Sylvaticus in Ames, Ray, Massachusetts. Yeah, and we talked to um, Jay and Dylan, and it, it, it was really cool to sit down and get to know them because I was never at that original interview. Um, so it was just cool to really get to know what they're all about. You know, I always knew, you know, their their goal of the brewery, um, but just hearing it come from them was awesome because you can tell that they're so passionate yeah. about what they do. Yeah, and I just love learning more about their barrel aging process because I think that's some of the best beer that they're making um, because, you know, it is always different, but they somehow recapture that magic every time you come around and you get that beer. So uh, kudos to uh, Brewery Sylvaticus. I know we were there last Friday. Uh, I had a boot. Ryan had a boot. Yes. And I had one of those pretzels. They are having heavenly. I mean, that place just rules. No, it does. That's why I go there at least once a week. That's true. Uh, so, Ryan, who do we have on deck this week? So, we're going to be talking to Dan and Lee from Brown's Brewing all the way up in Troy, New York. Troy, New York is beautiful, kid. All right? It's beautiful. Yeah. No, it's a, if you haven't been up there, just to like drive through it, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, again, I, I haven't been up that way in years. Uh, but I do remember really enjoying that. And there's tons of really cool things mm. to do up there. Um, there's a lot of other breweries you can check out as well. Yeah. So the duo that we talked to, uh, they're head of the, like their innovation team there. So they are brewing beers that you might not get in the market. You're going to get the tap room. But it was kind of cool to hear, you know, what styles of beer that they're brewing, what ingredients they're using. And I just like how they're kind of culinary forward brewers. Mm -hmm. You know, they think yep. of things as food and and mixed drinks and as mixed well. drinks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we don't worry. We did inform them of the spaghetti. So yes, it's not in the episode, but we informed them. We inf oh, you cut it? I did. That's too bad. That's well, always you know, a bummer. We we talk about it every week. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> you know we only mention it every single episode. Yeah, but they were so excited about it. I mean, it was just kind. Of, it's, you know what? Let's just move on. <laughs> we're gonna move on from that because <laughs> I just got caught. <laughs> yeah, you got caught, Ryan. Oh, that's too bad. But uh, yeah, I'm excited for this episode. Uh, so. We, this weekend, well, we, I guess me, went to yoga. Yeah, this past weekend you went to Seventh Wave to yeah. do some yoga, had some beer, had some pizza, and you got to meet up with the Mass Brew Bros and some other familiar faces. That's right, Captain Asshat, my yes. homie. Yes. What's up, Matt? Thanks for uh, hanging out. Thanks for drinking beer with me and my lady. It was great. That's it was awesome. a lot of fun. I, I was jealous. You could have come. I could have. I was going to drive round trip. I even have a broken butt and I did yoga. What's your excuse? Uh, thesis. Yeah, we know how that goes. Yeah, I need I need a master's degree. I just need to do it. Oh well, you know what? I'm gonna go drink some more beer. We're gonna listen to this episode, and mm. we're gonna catch you on the outro. Excellent. Cheers. Cheers. So Erica, so and Sound Guy Ryan. Hello. We are here at the beautiful Small Town Studios. Studios in do, lovely do. Georgetown, Massachusetts. Indeed. Indeed. In, in Dubai. Yeah. Uh, and it's turning nice out. Spring is kind of here. Uh, today was beautiful. Not super sunny, but it was 70 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. I wore a Wonderful. sweatshirt today and I was like, boy, I'm I'm toasty, toasty. in this sweatshirt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which has nothing to do with the interview that we're doing today. <laughs> we the the weather has know. nothing to do with uh, this. But uh, actually, fun story about uh, Troy, New York, where, one of the, where this brewery has one of their locations. Troy, New York is like an awesome scene i don't know if you've ever I, been there. i have never been there no on the list but i have not yet been i'm down with that that area of the, the country indeed um and now knowing that this brewery is in that area it's more incentive Even for me more to go reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so erica who are we interviewing today we're talking to browns 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 and we're here with our new friends dan and lee yeah what's going on fellas what's happening hey hey well thank you for doing this today um, we start every podcast by asking our guests um, their role at the brewery and their first memory of beer. So take it away. Uh -huh. You want to go first? Uh, let's see. Uh, we're both can kind of just consider the R&D research and development brewer, brewers here. Um, 
we keep the two tap rooms flowing and have been for coming on 10 years now. Nice. Um, both got into beer as, as home brewers um, separately, but took it from there. Yeah, I guess copy on that. You know, just pretty much we make whatever we feel like making. They've kind of greenlighted us to, you know, kind of push it as far as we'd like to, as long as we can sell it. And as far as my first memory of beer, I'm going to go ahead and say it's probably my dad drinking Bass Ale, which at the time was, you know, very progressive. Solid. Oh, that's yes. a nice throwback to my dad, <laughs> too. So, yeah. It was Labatt's and, yeah, Labatt's. I guess Genesee Cream. Ooh. <laughs> Creamers. I nice. love Genesee Cream. I don't care what people Solid. say. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> that green can. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously, you know, drinking watching your dad's drink, you know, was that a formative time in your life that you were like, oh, I want to be a research and development brewer in Troy, New York, or what What was the original plan for you guys? We both have, like like most brewers, we kind of stumbled into this. I worked in marketing prior to this and uh, just didn't like the office life. And so I, I quit without a plan, but then, you know, I started home brewing and then it quickly became apparent that that was the, uh, the right fit for my, my personality and mind. And I was lucky enough to get a job here after only homebrewing for about maybe a year or two. Nice. And it probably took a year of nagging to get in the front door, <laughs> but they, they were kind enough to give me a job here. And I've, I've been here ever since. Like Lee was saying, it's been about 10 years now. Oh, good for you. Yeah, I was a, a history major um, and bartending during, during college just to have money in my pocket and had started homebrewing as a way to have beer before I could buy it legally. <laughs> so. Yeah somehow that that loophole is is still there yeah um but yeah uh just really got into the creative end once i remember the very first batch that i brewed it just adding adding ingredients on my parents stovetop really just kind of blew my mind that you could you could really cater a beer in any facet that you that you wish so i just ran with it from that from that perspective very cool yeah so you mentioned that you realized pretty quickly early on that home brewing, you know, you wanted to make that less of a hobby, but more of a career. Um, was that kind of the moment in time? Like you just were like, Oh man, like what were you doing? Like to make that like a career, like what, what, what active steps were you doing other than, you know, just bothering Browns and being like, I want to work here. I want to <laughs> work here. I mean, um, who were you leveraging? Were you entering homebrew contests, et cetera? Uh, I was just, it was just show up. You know, if you, if you show up yep. and other people don't, then you're going to get the one, you're going to get the job. <laughs> I mean, I also, I went back to, I had already had my marketing degree, but I went back to school for, um, I was taking like math and like bio and chemistry courses, uh, to try to like, if it wasn't going to work out with a job to try to get a job, like, a, you know, get into like Siebel or something along those lines. Yep. Um, I guess at this point it's kind of, a, it's kind of moot, but at the time that was my plan. If I couldn't get a job was to try to get some education and use that as like a, a jump off point. Uh, so why why Browns? Was that a local brewery for you guys, or or is that just who happened to hire you? Both, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, I've always had a thing for Browns when I was a kid. Um, you know, we would we would come here and get food even before I could drink beer. Um, and then you know, oatmeal stout was one of the first beers that I had um, as far as like craft beer beers, and that kind of blew my mind just in terms of you know just like a beer that had like good mouthfeel to it yet it was still drinkable it was really kind of eye-opening for me nice yeah, I, I came out here for school um for grad school and like i said i was working at, at bars mostly in albany but um started working at browns as a bartender because i applied as a brewer and hadn't heard back so i thought <laughs> that maybe if i just got my foot in the door and pestered the brewers enough that uh i could I could weasel my way down there definitely but, uh yeah yeah just um, seemed to be the right place for me because I, I was really into homebrewing leading up to that point. And, um, Browns was really the, the one in the area that I had the most respect for in terms of what they were doing with their variety and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. How long has Browns been around? Yeah. 93. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's it's crazy. one of the older breweries on the East coast. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, what what history do you know about Browns? Uh, are the owners still the same owners that they were? The head brewer still the head, same head brewer? Uh, yeah, so Gary and Kelly Brown, it's a family-owned business. Um, 
they were, I think they had some investors early on. Yeah. Um, and it went through a couple of different name changes, such as like, you know, like Troy Brewing Company, Brown and Moran and whatnot. But um, the the ownership stake, as far as Gary and Kelly goes, has been since the beginning. Um, as far as head brewers go, um, there was a individual, Peter Martin, who was the one that hired both of us, uh, who actually, sadly, uh, he passed a couple of years back. But he was, I would say, probably the formative brewer here at Brown's for the longest time. But since then, it's more of like a decentralized thing where, mm-hmm. you know, we have some people that are in charge of the brewery up in Hoosick and they do more of the production scale stuff. And then Lee and I kind of have like a, a co-equal uh, R&D brewing situation down here where there's no one that works under us or above us. We just kind of just do our thing. You guys are like the mad scientists. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah yeah so now um, a cool job, yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah, no kidding. <laughs> the stressful job too because i mean like you said you can do whatever you want as long as it sells yeah i think after after 10 years of doing it we have a pretty good idea of what is uh too risky shall we say we, we've we've had our fair share of um beers that we thought were really cool um that no one else drank a lot of Ooh. and and what were those, yeah, what are some of those? Yeah. <laughs> like you know we did some beers where we would culture the yeast from flowers in our backyard and, oh, so and hunt, cool. culture it from honey and like ferment it in like individual open oak barrels you know like like really kind of like pushing it like beers. cool shit like really cool shit <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really cool stuff. Right. yeah we did some yeah open open fermented beers in uh like uh x french oak barrels that we cut the head off of yeah and it out of there um did some yeah spontaneous stuff we did a couple beers that were entirely made from different brett strain pretendomyces strains um i love that stuff (laughs) not so much yeah i guess just not super popular yet yeah Yeah. Um, there's definitely a there's a there's a big difference between a successful beer financially and a beer that we think is really like innovative and cool cool. Yeah. yeah for sure for sure so we have been very fortunate that um, Troy has really grabbed onto sours because um, that's something that we're, we're really passionate about. And we kind of just jumped in with both feet on that one. And it very fortunately worked out. Yeah. Most worked of the time. Well. Most yeah. Of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When it doesn't that's work good. out, we dump it. So that's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, so your Hoosick location, is that just like production or is there a tap room there as well? There's a tap room and restaurant as well. Yeah. It's okay. right on the, on the Willumsic river. It's actually a beautiful spot. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. So it's always interesting. Uh, breweries that started in the nineties that are still breweries today always seem to have that restaurant element. Is that a, was that a rule in the nineties that, you know, you had to have a, a brew pub with your brewery? I think it was just more, it's a difficult sell to just sell craft beer. You know, yeah. people weren't as into it. It was like very novel. Mm. So it was like, you know, restaurant first and then, then brewery second. Yeah. I think it's also a Northeast thing. Oh yeah. It's a ton. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. Northeast breweries are group pubs of some, they, they get it from, I don't know if it's you know, UK influenced or what, but yeah. Yeah. I know Brown's Brown's was very, very British focused for the longest yeah. time. Yeah. So for people who aren't from that area, what is Brown's known for? You mentioned, you know, an oatmeal stout, and then now you mentioned some English varieties. What is the beers that you are known for in 2021? So I would say as far as like the traditional beers that have been around for, you know, like 10, 20 years, probably the oatmeal stout and the cherry raz, which is like a fruited amber ale, mm-hmm. are the more popular uh, packaged products that we do. Um, as far as like, you know, if you're looking at like the actual beer scene, I'm going to pretend like people are, you know, appreciating what we're doing, which I think they are. It's just, it's just the, again, it's like about the scalability, you know, like we'll sell a ton of cherry raz um, and not as much, you know, barrel aged sour blends. But I do think that we've developed, like we've carved out a little niche for ourselves in the, uh, the, the barrel aged blend uh, sour world, however small that world may be. That's cool. No, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's a world like that. that not a lot of people are doing it well if i dare say i think a lot of people are trying to get into the sour game and they're kettle souring a lot of things right you but honestly like maybe drink it for a weekend yeah right (laughs) right yeah all right so before we get into your your process and what you guys are brewing on for your research and development side we have a quick word from our sponsors take it away ryan Did you know that your favorite Massachusetts breweries use hops from a local family-owned hop farm right here in Massachusetts? 
Our friends over at Four Star Farms are there for you, whether you're a commercial brewery or a small batch home brewer. Make sure to head over to their website today and get your hands on some of the best and freshest hops available locally. Cheers. Cheers. At our local homebrew shop, Beer and Wine Hobby, you can get everything you need to make beer, wine, cider, cheese, and more. Not sure where to start? They have knowledgeable staff there to help. Beer and Wine Hobby is family-owned and located in Danvers, Massachusetts. Visit their website, beer-wine.com, and use our promo code BREWROOTS for 10% off your online order today. Shirks on Tap is the box subscription service where you can get some of the dopest brewery t-shirts out there. I'm talking breweries from Dallas, San Diego, and even our home area of New England. And you might ask, how do I get my hands on some? To get your first box for $5, click the link below in our description, or head on over to our website, breweries.com. Remember, drink better beer, wear better shirts. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are still here with Dan and Lee, and... The two of them were homebrewers brewing what on a you know five gallon system before, and, a f- and uh, now you're on a, a big system. Ten years later, uh, what are you brewing on at Browns for your research and development scene? So there's there's a whole bunch. I mean, right now, obviously, we're pumping out the IPAs because you got to give the people what they want. Um, but oh, so it's like that in New York too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We also. Uh, we do a fair amount of lagers. We really, we love, yes. we love German Pilsner. Um, nice. So we try to have one of those on at all times. Right now, the, one of the beers that we really d- are digging on is a beer called Glass Ceiling, which is, uh, doesn't really have a style, but it's got a fair amount of Vienna malt, but is also thinned out with a little bit of rice. Oh, wow. So I would say cool. it's like, it's kind of like a, it's like a Mexican lager fermented with ale yeast using rice instead of corn, but hopped like a pale ale. That blows and my mind, just, but I love it. It, it sounds <laughs> it sounds weird on paper, but if you just drink it, it's super easy to drink. Good yeah. like lawnmower beer that's, you know, simple but perfect mm. to us. That's awesome. That sounds really good. Uh, so you mentioned some open fermentation. Are you guys doing any open fermentation with your lagers or? Just no, that would be really nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you guys want to get us a fooder, man. <laughs> no, I, I just didn't know if you guys were using fooders over there. So. That's no, me. that's 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 been on the list for a long time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the money gets spent in certain ways and we'll, we'll keep pushing for it. So hopefully yeah. you'll be able to say yes to that question soon. Yeah, definitely. So what um, size system are you brewing on right now? Uh, we have a 15 barrel. Nice. We generally yeah. do seven barrel batches just yeah. to try to keep keep it as uh, fresh and new. Mm-hmm. So does any of your R&D stuff then get packaged at like the higher level? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, um, anything that, that has done well, in our tap rooms, they they uh, weigh that option of scaling it up. And one um, more recent of those uh, has been one of our fruited uh, kettle sours. Uh, it was formerly known as raspberry sour uh, down here, and they have since um, scaled it up. And its new title is Me and You. Um, it's a like four and three quarter percent, um, real, real low hop nice. presence. You know, just very strong raspberry presence. Yeah. Nice. But we've got a couple of those that, that have done well. So they're, they're kind of weighing whether or not they're going to uh, add a couple to that list. Yeah. Um, how much as research and development brewers, do you guys rely on, you know, your front of house staff to kind of gauge what your clientele are looking for or are drinking a lot of, um, and do you ever meet with them just to kind of say like, you know, Everyone's yeah. asking for a pastry stout or everyone's asking right. for fruited sours. Um, and how we, much? We, I would say we definitely get a, we get a lot of word from the bartenders, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we also, you know, we check the tanks every morning. So it's, uh, we know what's selling and what's not. Yeah. If there's a lot <laughs> yeah. of kegs missing, then you know. Right. Yeah. Right. When somewhere. Yeah. Um, obviously, being a research and development brewer, there are trends in the brewing industry. Um, you know, we saw. Brute IPAs. Brute IPAs. <laughs> <laughs> now we're seeing like slushy sours and all yeah, of those, yeah. those great styles, I guess, right? <laughs> and milkshake IPAs. Um, how much do you try to ignore trends or try to, you know, 
you know, steer towards steer them. Steer towards guess. them. You yeah. know. I, I think to some degree you have to embrace it a little bit um, as much as I wish that we didn't have to. Yeah. Um, I do like, there are some trends that I think are a lot more fun than others and some trends that we just like do not do because of like, which no, trends? I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> we are not going to do a slushy IPA. Good. Right. I think that's super lame. Yes. <laughs> um, I will. We will do a lot of new England IPAs. Yeah. Uh, those are super cool. And I, we like them too. So I'm not, you know, I got nothing bad to say about that. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we tend to, to stay away from lactose for the most part, but mm-hmm. um, even some with of our sours, sours yeah, yeah, use it and some don't. We we honestly prefer that you know as many people can enjoy it as possible. So yeah, it, as soon as you add lactose, you're cutting out a portion of the consumers that can. For sure. Definitely. Also, I feel like for beer, I want it to be relatively quaffable. And if there's a ton of lactose in it, you just can't drink it. Like I want to drink right. a beer yeah. like it's a beer, not like it's port. Unless yeah, we're doing like we're doing like an imperial stout or something, then we'll have That's it have a fair thing. amount of body. But yeah. even still, we won't do much lactose in those either. You know, it's, mm. we really like, if you want the body, get it from, you know, oats and your fermentation schedule and your mash schedule. Do you see a lot of trends with, with loggers and pilsners? Uh, we see a lot of people. Yeah. Or where do you see a trend going? going towards yeah. Right now? Yeah. I think in our area, we do. It seems to be in the last couple of years, they've really come into their own. I think a lot of that is Love thanks it. to breweries like uh, Suarez, which is in downstate New York. Mm-hmm. You know, like they've made it super cool to do lagers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, I think that a lot of brewers like drinking lager. Yeah. So sure. they're going to try to make what they want to drink. And then eventually the people will come along. Yeah. You know, I think so- some trends are brewer led and some trends are people led. Right. And I think the, lo- the lager is definitely a brewer led trend. Yeah. Definitely. Um, how much did COVID affect? what you guys were able to do for innovation uh, was tremendously. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, it was awful. It's a rough year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bet. we're just coming out of it now. I guess the one thing that it really did that was like kind of cool is we got a small canning line. Ooh. Um, so nice. we have a large canning line at our production facility and we have a small canning line here. So on Monday, we'll just get an order from both places and Lee and I will can up, you know, like let's say four four to like 10 cases of each style that people want so like very small amounts yeah just to kind of keep our draft uh as like a a better takeaway option yeah yeah (laughs) yeah but did you see it as an opportunity to maybe think outside the box because you had more time to maybe think about recipes or were you trying to just stick to what you knew and and make sure it sells yeah honestly we focused much more on sales because mm-hmm. of COVID, because we didn't have the luxury of just doing something fun when it might not sell. Right, right. So I think COVID was definitely tough for a lot of people in the brewing industry. We were lucky sure. to keep our jobs the entire time. Good for you guys. Which we're very grateful for. Yeah, definitely. But things are much better, much better now, and we're things are looking up for the summer. So yeah, for sure. That's good. I'll drink to that. <laughs> um, so what were some, I mean, obviously you're thinking, you're trying to keep your jobs, you're trying to keep things flowing out the door, but obviously in the back of your mind, you guys are innovators. What were you thinking? What was that next beer that you wanted to brew that you just couldn't brew last year? Hmm. It depends a lot on the seasons, but uh, honestly, we had, we had uh, right as, as COVID kicked in, we had really started investing a lot more time into um, barrel aging and blending Imperial Stouts and had made uh, several batches that were intended for barrels. And some some made it into barrels and some we just decided would be better off, um, you know, blended from mm-hmm. steel and with with other additions. Actually. So in cool. some ways that, that kind of has worked to our benefit because we, we did win um, a place on the on Vine Pair's top 50 beers of 2020 nice. last year with one of our uh, – stainless blends that, um, we, that we otherwise would not have. Yeah. Right. Of yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Well, that's one positive, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so where do you see, I mean, we, we, we asked about trends and we kind of alluded to loggers and pilsners, but is there a trend that you see as research and development brewers that the, the industry is kind of shifting towards? I mean, aside from that, it seems like, you know, I, I don't really have a, like an innovative answer aside from seems like new England IPAs aren't going anywhere. Yeah. It seems like the like pastry stouts aren't going anywhere. I think fruited sours are getting higher ABV um, yeah. to try and uh, counter the, you know, the it's, uh, it's strange, but it's, it's countering the, the uh, seltzer movement because that's the one thing that they can, they can have 
you know, you're not really right. going to make it more drinkable than it already is because it's already pretty drinkable. But yeah. adding alcohol usually has adds some saleability. Are you guys um, diving to the seltzer game now? Not yet. Yeah. I think that might be that decision might be out of our hands. <laughs> if it were in our hands, we would say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And any um, any reason why you would say no? I'm just curious. It's always funny to hear what brewers have to say. I don't know. I mean, I think that the part that of this job that really grabs both of us is the creative aspect. Mm-hmm. And with seltzers, you're you're very much constricted to uh, using ingredients that are not necessarily natural. So you're pigeonholed yeah. almost. Yeah. 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 You can't yeah. be so creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To make it, you know, to make it it. Uh, sell at a price point you know that can can rival what's already out there you can't really use real fruit yeah and, and if you did and if you did then it would add color to it and maybe a little turbidity and like that might turn people off right right yeah but i i think as far as like the seltzer game the only thing that kind of caught my eye is like maybe could be fun is dialing in like different types of acid additions like citric malic mm-hmm. lactic to try to get different mouthfeel yeah yeah but you know, that's more of like a mixology, you <laughs> yeah. know, right, right. and brewing. Yeah. Before we keep going, actually, I think we need another uh, sponsorship break. I think you're right, Erica. All right. So take it away, sponsorships. Are you a solo artist, band, podcaster, or anyone else who needs recording services? Well, we got a place for you where your vision can become a reality. Welcome to Small Pond Studios, built by hand with heart and sweat equity by musicians for musicians. Go to smallpondstudios.io to reach out to get more information. And make sure you let them know that Brute sent you. Hey, Sound Guy Ryan here. Didn't know if you heard, but we're a part of the Hopped Up Network. There you'll find other informative podcasts about beer. So go ahead, follow them on social media, and visit them on their website, hoppedupnetwork.com, to learn more about the people, beer, and breweries from around the country. And until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers. All right, so we're back, Erica. Hello. Want to ask some questions about, uh, you know, you know things, you know things, things like, stuff. you know, when I get like ideas, I go for like a bike ride. But you know, Ooh. that's like the weirdest thing that's about me. What about like weird? Maybe what does Dan and Lee do? Yeah. How do you guys get ideas for your crazy R and D beers? I'd say a lot of them are culinary inspired. Yeah. Cool. We like food. Also, <laughs> cocktail inspired. Yeah. All right. Nice. Do you guys have a favorite cocktail? I like my, mine is a Negroni. So mixed drinks, inspiration and food. and food. Yep. Um, obviously you can't make like, like a roast beef beer or something like that, or like a tater tot beer, but you know, what are some food recipes that you derive, you know, food, beer recipes that you've derived from, you know, food or flavors that you've had? Um, I can take, I can take one. We're, um, this is why we have our notes. Maybe there's a new <laughs> yes. question like this. I'm like, oh man, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess one the one that I would say right here, just looking at our list here, we did a, uh, a blended sour uh, called Patch, which was uh, strawberries, elderflower, and vanilla. Ooh. Ooh. That sounds amazing. Um, and that was more of just, you know, it's not super, it's not a big reach, but, you know, like strawberries and vanilla, like strawberries and cream is an awesome combination that we love. And elderflower, we thought, could just add a little bit of floral element to it while not being too off the rails. Like if you're doing something like hibiscus might be a little bit too like tart and like cranberry-like, whereas the elderflower is really kind of round and sweet. Yeah. Yeah, another another one that um, in the sour uh, category, uh, we have like a, a pie series that um, kind of emulates different pies. Uh, one that we did recently with uh, peach cobbler, Ooh, so we fun. used actually peach and apricot. Um, where we got one coming out that we've done before a couple times now. Um, mango lassi sour. Oh, cool! One of the awesome. few that we actually uh, incorporate lactose in. Yeah, having just bashed it. But uh, yeah, so that one is heavily fruited with mango, um, lactose, vanilla, and a touch of cardamom for a spice. Spice, yeah, that sounds wonderful. That is cool. So how do you guys? Yeah, we're, we like that one. It's good. How do you guys um, 
kind of figure out the exact mix of all that, like the strawberry and the vanilla and the um, elderflower, like, do you just like do little small test bashes until you figure it out? Or you've just done so much now that you just kind of know how much works. I'd say at this point, we've done it quite a bit. So we have a lot of like data yeah. to know what works and what doesn't. Prior yeah. to that, we used um, Milk the Funk as a really awesome reference for, yeah, for brewers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we use that quite a bit for, for dosing and then also just like learning how to make good sour beer. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot of a lot of literature that's that's really good. There's um, Michael Tonsmere, this author, wrote uh, American Sour Beer, uh, has a really good section on um, just fruit, uh, how much fruit to use yeah. per pound per gallon, uh, as well as, you know, tips on blending from several different breweries. Mm-hmm. Just really, really uh, technically and practical. It's yes. very practical. It just yeah. kind of gives, gives you very practical solutions because yeah. sometimes it gets too technical and <laughs> I just want to know like how, like practically speaking, how do you do it? Right. What do you do? Right. Just tell how me how to do, do it. it. Just give me the wiki- <laughs> Wikipedia article. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you guys then um, filter your beer or how do you, I mean, do you keep it natural or? We don't filter our beer. Um, all of our bottled stuff is naturally carbonated. Okay. All right, cool. Cool. Um, and our cans is forced carbonation. Yeah. Our yeah. Gas is forced carbonation. Yeah. Um, is there a fruit that just hasn't ever transferred over in flavor wise for you? I, I always yes. think like peach. I can never find a, I love peach and I can never find a peach beer that I actually enjoy. Yeah. I'm we sorry. <laughs> We've made a good peach beer once. Yeah. Um, but it's very hard. And I, I think I had a, what was it? There was a crooked stave peach beer that a friend of ours from Colorado brought back that blew my mind in terms of its peach character. And I don't remember what it was, but I think it used Palisade peaches. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's cool. And so that was the one. You know, like the whole, like, the, that's the white whale that we're going to be chasing forever <laughs> yeah. and yeah. never. There's a lot of, um, again, a lot of tips from other brewers that say incorporate apricot to, to really bump up the peach. Because oh, for whatever reason, okay. a lot of that flavor just ferments out. Yeah. And, yeah. But same with blueberry. Blueberry is really difficult. Yeah, yeah tough. blueberry is very yeah. difficult. Because it's all get, water pretty much, right? Yeah. You get amazing color from it, but um, you're just left with this really woody Almost mm. tannic note. Yeah, yeah, if right. You don't, if you don't add uh, something else to to bump that up, then it's not lackluster. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Usually, when we've used blueberry in the past, it's with like with raspberry and blackberry, right. or with, with Earl Grey tea. Yeah, you know, like something to kind of like yeah. complement uh, it. Elderberry tea. Oh, and elderberry, yeah. elderberries, and that. Mm. Yeah, nice. I guess in the vein of pies, you know, you mentioned your pies uh, with. The hall, with October, I guess, being six months away or whenever it is. <laughs> sure. But um, have you guys been asked to do pumpkin beers in the past? And do you make pumpkin beers? And do you we, hate making pumpkin <laughs> beers? <laughs> we, we, we absolutely do. And it is our... Yes, do all. It's very, very popular. <laughs> it is our nightmare. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a, from a production standpoint, it's a nightmare. Like we were saying, we, we... I don't even know. I don't know how much it is. We get like... It's by the 400 and 500 pumpkins that we... Oh, jeez. Oh so up. you use like actual pumpkins. You're not we use yeah. tiny, like the little ones, the pie pumpkins. Oh, nice. Do you guys so use we... any, uh, uh, what is it? Summer squash, uh, in their pumpkin beers. Cause I know sometimes a lot of brewers do that because it gives actually like, a more yeah. pumpkin yeah. flavor. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even be mad at them. I'm I hate doing it so much, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> cause we, you know, we have to roast each and you have to cut them, scoop roast them out, bake them, yeah. Yeah, bake them, them out. Yeah. yeah. You know, after, it. and then puree it and oh, then, God. yeah. And then that gets tossed in the boil. And I, I mean, it is a good pumpkin beer. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I think Browns makes my favorite pumpkin beer. Yeah. Um, so it's pumpkin beer, not pumpkin spiced. There is pumpkin spice in there too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's you know it's not in the forefront. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're using canned pumpkin or whatever. It's it's no, no, pumpkin. it's real. And it's, yeah. It's a real pain. But it's, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. All right. So we're gonna. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We, we get it from a uh, we get it from like a local farm, you know. Like it's 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 a good it's, it's all good vibes, cool. and like the staff all chips in and helps to do it. Nice, yeah. but you know, ten years in, it's like I, I would like to have an assistant to do this now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seriously, I've done this ten years. I'm I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> um. All right, so I'm curious what you guys are drinking at home to get some inspiration on some beers. Are there local breweries around that you're digging, or any national breweries that we may not know about, or our listeners may not know about? We probably should be drinking more of other people's stuff, but our stuff is very free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're also yes. both uh, young parents, so it's it's not always easy getting out. Yeah, like also COVID. 
but <laughs> also facts, COVID. Facts, yes. yeah. 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 I mean, there's definitely a lot of breweries in this area that we both respect and owe a lot of our inspiration to from because everyone just contributes to, you know, the whole scene so much that it's, that it's a combined effort. Yeah. I would yeah. say a lot of it comes just from seeing what other, what our peers are doing. You know, even if we don't get a chance to try it ourselves, just like, you know, if you hear about the idea, you can see if that's a good idea, yeah. you know, in your head. Definitely. Yeah. But we, we are, we are lacking in our drinking, I would say. <laughs> not, not drinking as much as I'd like to be. Well, you're going to have a spaghetti now. So yeah, right. Gonna, so. <laughs> um, speaking about like camaraderie amongst breweries and all this stuff, uh, collaborations are huge in the brewing industry. Uh, it seems like uh, coast to coast. I mean, in our area, it seems like a yeah. new collaboration is happening every day. But uh, have you guys done any collaborations or is that something that Browns is about? No, we've done quite a few in the past. It's been a while because of COVID. COVID yeah, I mean, yeah. we've collaborated with, we have another brewery here in Troy called Rareform that we've collaborated with a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I alluded to a, a friend in Denver who brews at a place called uh, Our Mutual Friend. We've collaborated with them in the past. Um, we had a, a, a large group um, annual oh, yeah. project that we did that was, it was fun, but also just a, a complete gaffe. It was... Um, too many cooks. Yeah. <laughs> Different cluster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it usually ended up being somewhere between like 12 and 15 breweries. Oh, And geez. one brewer from one of those breweries was doing all of the work while everyone else was uh, drank. Oh my God. Was, <laughs> the, was the beer actually called too many cooks? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's such a good <laughs> That's name. Great. That's perfect. Um, that was like, that was like a New York wide thing. That was, that yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm always curious to know, um, is there a retired beer at Brown's that you wish would come back and why? I guess we don't have to wish we can just do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, that's there are, true. Yeah. There are some that, um, we still, we love, but we just know that they don't sell as quickly. Like our, our original Porter, that's, that's we really enjoy, but everyone just loves the, the Porter aged in whiskey barrels, you know, bourbon barrels so much that if we put the, the Porter on tap, there's like a small section of people, of the consumers that'll be like super psyched about it. But everyone else is like, where's, <laughs> Why is not barely? Yeah, I want the whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and those people will nag for the porter and we're like, we're on your side here. Yeah. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's just not feasible right. to do it because it'll be on for months, you know. Yeah. 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 Um any guilty pleasure beers for you? Mm. Mm. You meant that Genesee cream ale? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't yeah, no, why feel guilty? Yeah. You know? <laughs> just enjoy it. Yeah, that's true. 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 We agree with that. Yeah. All right, so we want our listeners to make their way to both locations for Browns. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us where those locations are? Yeah, you bet. So Lee and I are here in, uh, in Troy, New York. We're right on, uh, on the Hudson River. So it's 417 River Street in Troy. And like, I don't know if you, you were saying you'd been to Troy before. There's like quite a few. There's other breweries here. Yeah. There's a pretty cool beer scene. There's like lots of little shops, a lot of cool nice. coffee shops popping up. So it's definitely like... It's walkable. Yeah, it's a fun town. Yeah, cool. Like a lot of fun. Uh, and the other one is at 50 Factory Hill uh, Road in North Hoosick, New York. Cool. That is um, Hoosick Falls. Yeah, <laughs> um, that is that's less walkable. You know, that's that's more of like a destination. You're going there. Yeah, but yeah. it's beautiful. Again, that's also on a river, and like the tap room uh, literally is on the river. Like, there's no yeah. land between the tap room and the river. There's it's also just, a cool. beautiful waterfall right behind the brewery nice hmm. so, so very, very scenic yeah definitely um and can where are you distributed or do you if you if you know where you're distributed i would direct people to our website okay. because things change yes. and we stay in the basement and make beer <laughs> <laughs> as of last year they lock you away some of our some of our distribution changed because of everything that's going on yes i did talk to our salesperson prior to this to ask if they distribute in where you guys are and he said we're not currently in massachusetts but we are working on it and should be soon yeah, yeah. we look forward to that <laughs> let us know if we can help we probably yeah. can't but let us know <laughs> uh sound guy ryan always seems to have a question he wants to sneak past the goalie so ryan well i want to ask my favorite question oh, and oh, that oh, is what do you guys want to learn more about in in just in general sure. in life sure in general <laughs> brewing whatever floats your boat <laughs> Cooking. i would say in general i want to learn more about uh amaro's like Tell amari more yeah yeah just like you know like we were talking before about campari and yeah, yeah. you know oh yes I like, I like bitter liqueurs <laughs> I, I, those are really cool to me and i know very little about them and there's this whole world out there 
And I think that that's a lot of fun because it has the balance of like, you know, sweetness and bitterness and booziness and complexity. And I feel like there's, there's a lot of inspiration to be taken from that. And there's also a lot of, you know, cool, interesting drinks to make with them. So for sure, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I want to know about. That total world is like underwater aliens to me. You know, it's like <laughs> there's so many flavors that you're just like, wait, that's the flavor. I've never even heard of that before. So I exactly. agree. Yeah, it's a cool, that's a one I've never even thought of. Dan and I have both been really into like just anything fermentable um, pretty much as long as we've been here. So we've, we've really tackled just about everything that can be done and uh, are just always looking into making kombucha, making sourdough bread. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've had a foray into cheese making for a bit. Would love to get back into that. Nice. As time will tell. Um, yeah, just anything like of that of that nature is always really really interesting to us. So yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, we mm -hmm. want our listeners to go to Troy, yeah, or Hoosick Falls, <laughs> uh, both on a river. So you you gotta go out there. Yeah. I think Ryan, once we get vaccinated, and Erica, once we get vaccinated, we should go out to Troy, New York. You graduate college, and we should uh, hang out. It's not that far. In the rivers. We'll take a nice little drive. Yeah. Yeah, hit us up. We're, we're vaccinated. We're ready to go. All right. We'll hang out. We will hang out. We'll drink spaghetti. We'll bring the we'll bring <laughs> yeah. the Miller highlights and the uh, Aperol. And, uh, Deal, man. And then we'll drink your beer, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and lastly, our very last question, um, we would like to ask, what are you most proud of? Our kids. Yeah, our kids not Aww. being terrible. Yay. <laughs> Well, congrats to you guys on making them terrible, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, we're working on it. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a process. Yeah. Well, that's good. Dan and Lee, thank you for taking some time out of your day. Uh, I yeah, know we, we really appreciate it. We probably got you away from cleaning things and brewing beer, yeah, but uh, no problem. Yes. But uh, fun. <laughs> it's awesome to hear what people are doing. I mean, you're not that far away from Massachusetts, and it seems like a completely different beer scene sometimes. And but we hear a lot of the same yes. trends, which is kind of cool, you know, and people yeah, enjoying what they're doing and having fun, which is, it's always a good thing. So yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So um, make sure to make your way out to Browns if you can. In Troy, New York. That's right. Or Hoosick Falls. Or Hoosick Falls. <laughs> you can't forget about Hoosick Falls. <laughs> Don't forget. Uh, cool. So. Until next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Well, thanks everyone who made it this far in the episode, and you know it's Ryan's favorite portion of the episode. Right, Ryan? Yeah, it means I'm really close to going home. That's right. Well, you can spaghet about going home right now because you cut that out of the episode and you're going to have to put it in, in the outtakes. Maybe. That's right. Well, maybe our listeners can get that portion of the episode on our Patreon, Ryan, right? Absolutely. What's our Patreon? It is uh, www.patreon.com slash Podcast. That's right. Or you can follow us on all other social medias and learn about the spaghetti even more. Absolutely. That's right. Well, until next week, we have an awesome episode for, with... Winter Hill. And I don't mention the spaghetti in that episode, but if you're curious, it is a Miller High Life with, with Aperol filled up to the neck. And you put a little squeeze of lemon into it, and it's wonderful. And this is where I cut you off so we can have them enjoy the rest of their day, and I can enjoy the rest of my day. That's right. Cheers. Cheers. I can't believe you cut that portion. That's the best portion. It's not. It's not the best portion. It's fucking annoying. No, people need to know about the spaghetti. They do. If they listen to any episode Yeah, but if this is the done, first one they ever listened to, now they don't know about it. But then they, they listen to the back catalog, and they're like, oh, spaghetti. Oh, spaghetti. Oh, spaghetti. Oh, spaghetti. Literally. Spaghetti about it. Sp you spaghetti about it. You spaghetti about it. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's go to the outro. All right.